Medical Center Worldwide and our community, we can put this message forth so that there is a transformation. This is the philosophy of transformation. Now it's interesting, the Apostle Paul said, be not conformed to the things of this world. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So when we buy in to the things of this world and we conform to the things of this world, it's so fascinating that if we look at history, how laws have changed, things have changed, that we're becoming on some levels more civilized on the outer. But as long as there is anything going on on the planet, the collective unconscious, each and every one of us need to do our own work. And believe me, I have been doing this a lot of years. And I hear people say, why would God do that? Why would God let a plane crash and innocent children suddenly be killed? Why would God create this, that, and the other? So in our way of life, we know that we have free will, that we have a freedom of choice. And the most profound statement that I've ever heard when someone says, why would God do this, is by Rabbi Silverman. And I'm going to share this with you. It's called Why God Why. And it's by Rabbi William Silverman, who uh, is a very, uh, a rabbi of note and an author. He said, I walk today through the slums of life, down the streets of wretchedness and pain. I trod today where few have trod, and as I walked, I challenged God. I saw the sots in the bar room, the prostitutes in the dance halls. I saw the thieves as they picked pockets. I saw men and women devoid of life, living in worlds of sin. And above the dim, I whispered, why God? Why, God, why? I walk today down the lanes of hate, hearing the jeers of bitter men, hearing the names as they cursed and spat, Dago, nigger, kite, faggot. I saw the dejected men they stoned. I felt the anguish of their cries. I saw them as they slapped the lonely, turned their back on human needs. These God called his sons, gasping for air. I cried, why, God, why? Why? I walked a day through the war's grim dregs, over fields of blood, over graveless men. I saw the dead, the crucified, the headless, the limbless, the pleading, the crying. I saw the pain, the waste. I smelled the odor of rotten flesh. I saw the children gathered round watching, naked, hungry, weeping, diseased, dirty, the baby trying to nurse from the dead mother. The ruins, the agony, the despair, disaster, disaster all around. Blinded by tears, I fled these streets. I stumbled, then I stopped. And I shouted, why, God, why? Why do you let men sin, hate, and suffer? Unmerciful Father, God, are you blind? Are you wicked and cruel? God, can you watch and do nothing? Why must this be? The world grew silent. I awaited reply. The silence was heavy. I started to tremble. I waited long, half rebuking, half fearing. Then I heard from close behind me, why, man, why? Why, man, why? Why, why? We are at choice, each and every one of us. We have a lot of work to do on the planet. And in going to Oslo, you know, I am the president-elect of the International Foundation for Rural Peace and Research, and I was meeting with my board internationally. We have a doctor from India, we have a doctor from Poland, we have one from Amsterdam, and uh, others. And they wanted me to be the president, I did not want to be the president. I have enough to do in my life. And it was really interesting, and they shared their reasons why they wanted me to be the president of the foundation. 
and not only my grasp on the global level, but the fact that they felt that I could communicate what the goals of the International Foundation for World Peace and Research were about. And also the nomination of the Nobel Peace Prize of the Reverend Dr. Father Professor Ida, who wrote a book called The Charity Peace Model, which is something that is being utilized all over the world. And when I was in Africa speaking to 25,000 students and faculty, it was so amazing to see the work in progress, to be distributing the food on the three campuses that he founded and has shelters on, the founding of five manufacturing companies so that the unemployed are now gainfully employed. This is Africa. This was an obscure village in Africa that is now a pilgrimage and on the map of people all over the world. And although he is a Catholic priest and they always want to promote him to bishop or monsignor, he says, no, then I would not be with my people. So what is so amazing when I bore witness to what goes on there, I said, you're doing what we talk about in the United States. And we have some wonderful, we have the Doctors Without Borders. We have some amazing uh, organizations in our country. But to really put the works with the faith and to acknowledge at a very deep level that there is mediation, reconciliation, and sacrament. Those are like the main things in his book. That when we can have conflict resolution. And my other goal uh, in going to Oslo was then to fly over to Switzerland to meet with the president and the director of the United Nations, Geneva. I had met her in New York, and we had a connection. And when I flew to Switzerland, we met at my hotel and then off to the United Nations. And we began talking about peace and that how everyone brings their own agenda to the table. And she said, sometimes we have people from all over the world and they get in these screaming matches and they forget why they're there. And I said, because everyone brings their own consciousness. And she said, I sit in kind of a meditative state and I see each one and the beauty and the innocence within them that wanted them to come forth and be part of a peace movement. And I said, once we take a stand, and think about it, once you take a stand on anything, be it peace, be it love, be it health, whatever that stand is, everything unlike that will show up. It is amazing how that happens. Everything unlike that shows up. All the stuff that we bring to the table of life, it shows up. And we have to look at it, and I love our way of life because as it shows up, we do not beat ourselves up and condemn. We say, thank you. It has surfaced. I can release it and return it to its native nothingness from whence it came because the truth is, it is neither person, place, nor thing. It's the life and the energy that I give to it. Think about it. The things we give vital life force energy to, that we give our power away to. And I shared a couple of weeks ago, it's not the biggies, it's the everyday, it's the little stuff that we give our power away to. So when we were in this discussion about the peace movement and what needs to be done and the people in the grassroots movement that have taken a stand on nonviolence and that Gandhi took a stand on nonviolence and civil disobedience. And when I asked, I said, do you know where Gandhi got that? And he goes, well, then, you know, Martin Luther King, you know, Gandhi was such an influence with Martin Luther King and the walks to freedom. And I said, well, if you read Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, he was sent to prison because he would not pay taxes to a government that endorsed slavery. And when Thoreau went to see him and said, Ralph, what are you doing in prison? He said, no, not what am I doing in prison, what are you doing out there that you would pay taxes to a government that would embrace slavery? I will refuse to pay taxes to any government that would embrace such a thing. And took a stand in his life. Gandhi said that that was the greatest influence in him, in his life, that Emerson's civil disobedience and taking a stand at what no longer served. And what happens? Laws change. Does consciousness change? That's a little bit longer. 
but those of us that absolutely come into spirituality and realize that we are one, regardless of color, race, creed, or sexual orientation, we are one. So when others are saying, why does God allow this? No, the silence is deadening. Why, man, why? Why, man, why? And when we come to that realization within ourselves that we don't have to judge outside of ourselves, you know, we call ourselves so spiritual, but you know, we get little clickies and we gossip and we, you know, say, you know, very interesting things. And the school ministry, no one gossip, they just pass very relevant information. You know, it's, it, you know how it is. This is so relevant. Yes, and rationalize it out. But the truth is, does it serve? Does it serve? And when we can see that it really doesn't serve the collective consciousness, that we begin to heal ourselves. And one of my colleagues did this wonderful experiment. And he was a psychologist and did a lot of seminars. And he had 500 people in the room. And he passed out balloons for each person. And he had them write their name on it. And each person wrote their name. And then they put the balloons in this really small room. And they said, we're giving you five minutes to find your own bloom that you wrote your name on it. There was chaos and pushing and shoving and looking for their bloom. Five minutes, but might not one person out of 500 found their bloom. And then he said, ah, interesting. Now I want you just to go in and get a bloom and find the owner. <laughs> so everybody went in, they took a bloom. They found the owner. That was like five minutes. And he said, isn't it amazing that when we're about the collective consciousness and about everyone winning, realizing, and my thing is, your success makes mine possible. When something good happens for you, it's like it happened for me. I'm thrilled. I'm elated. I think it is wonderful. I have more students than I can count that have published their books, that are out there doing their thing, and it is wonderful, including uh, Neil Donald Walsh, who was in my congregation in San Diego. So I am just elated because your success makes mine possible. My success makes yours possible. When people get into that envy thing, they don't realize that we live in an abundant universe. And that as we open to that good and that energy, then it's easy to go in and find your balloon and say, here it is. I may not have known you very well before this exercise, but now we have a relationship. And I give you something energetically. And that as we affirm one another, as we acknowledge that we're drawn together through our similarities, we grow through our differences. And believe me, I had an amazing trip. And when, when the President of the United Nations, Dr. Hanshin, said that she would endorse my candidate for the Nobel Peace Prize, I was so elated that she got it. That, you know, what's being done in this very obscure village that's become a, pil a pilgrimage, I was just absolutely elated. So I go from Oslo and I fly to Switzerland, I fly back, I get back at midnight. And I've got to, you know, I'm getting up at five in the morning. My plane takes off in the morning. And so I'm in the taxi and I give him my card and he's saying that the card won't work on his machine, his machine is defective. And I said, well, I do have some English pounds and I have some American dollars. And we go in and the, ho the uh, man at the reception, the receptionist, and he said, well, then he's going to have to pay exchange on it. And he goes, oh, then I will have to pay exchange. And I said, well, what I'm aware of is I have used this card all over Europe. I use it on the taxi on the way to the airport in Switzerland. And that if your machine is defective and we want to get on the solution level, then I will give you this cash. And whatever the exchange is, you know, I call these the little toll fares of life. If your machine doesn't work, get it fixed. But you take the cash. Or, you know, make the card work. That's the option. And the receptionist, he's saying, well, you know, all that exchange and all. And I said, I do not need your commentary. Let's be really clear about this. He goes, oh, yeah, I'm not going to say anything. I said, you already did. By this time, I'm really pissed off. You know, it's midnight. 
I don't need to hear this. You know, go to your room. And, uh, and he's all in, in the tech cab driver. So, you know, I walked away and got, you know, into the, the elevator. And then I call, you know, for a wake-up call, and then I set my phone, and I'm doing everything, because by this time it's one in the morning. And I get the wake-up call 15 minutes late, the same gentleman. And, uh, but my, my phone did go off, you know. And I felt like it was kind of like, nya, 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 you know, we were 15 minutes late. And, uh, but I let that go. And I call and I say, please call a cab. I need to get, get to the train station to catch my plane. And he goes, well, you're going to have to key it in, key in your room. And I said, I have been staying here twice, 10 days apiece, you know, uh, December, then January, and now this time, uh, three times. And I've never keyed in. I said, come up and get my luggage, and I'll be happy to key in my, my room number. Oh, I'll, I'll key it in. So I thought, you know, this is so interesting. I, he's just irritating me. And uh, I get downstairs, and the cab driver is there, and very sweet, and he takes my luggage. And, and uh, this person doesn't even say goodbye and thank you for staying here. You know, and I could hardly wait to get out of there and not look at his face. And uh, so I get in the cab, and I said, that's interesting. I am the president of the International Foundation for World Peace, and that little person in there has just pissed me off so much. So I, I guess I, have, I still have work to do on this. Uh, when we're travel-worn and we need sleep and we need rest and regeneration, you know, there are times in our life that we shoot from the hip and we clean it up later. And you just forgive yourself and you just move on from that. And I also think that there is such a thing as graciousness for guests that stay somewhere. So we will have that discussion also. But it's not, and I'm laughing at myself, and I'm reading the Daily Word, which is on, you know, prayers for all people and, and uh, embracing all people, and not, not everyone acts from their highest self. And the truth is, when we do not operate from our higher self, there's always something in the energy field that will remind us if we are on the path. That each of us is subject to the human condition. Each of us falls, we brush ourselves off, and we keep on keeping on. And then the cab driver said, oh yeah, those cab drivers are the black, we call them black marketers because they want the cash so they can stuff the cash, <laughs> not declare it. And he's telling me, this always go with my company. And so I said, I will always go with your company. You know, and, and we just like, in, in a moment's time, everything is shifted. And you're laughing. And you're acknowledging that the minute, you know, we think that, we're so evolved, there's something that comes up that we get to look at. So when we take responsibility for our lives and come from integrity energetically, we realize that each and every one of us is subject to the human condition. Forgive yourself, next time will be better. And as we open the space to allow the universe to do what it does best, energetically, everything dissolves. It's returned to its native nothingness as we feel the energy, the light, the truth, and the beauty of why we are here and what it is that we are given to do. And when we say, why God, why? The silence, why man, why? That why is within each of us. And as we heal our own issues, the space is created to be who we are. And that's why I love this way of life, even though at times it's very uncomfortable to look at ourselves. But if we don't, if we do not look at ourselves, then we will perpetuate our own shadow, and it shows up in war, and it shows up all over the world. So today, we are here to let go and let God do what God does best by means of each and every one of us. Do you agree? Yes. Absolutely. And where are we going? Higher. Higher. Where? Higher, Higher yet. yet. Where? Higher, Higher yet. yet. And so it is. God bless you.